The Shadow of the Wind is a novel by Carlos Ruiz Zafón that takes place in Barcelona, Spain in the aftermath of the Spanish Civil War, during which military leader Francisco Franco and his fascists defeated the Republicans of the former democratic regime, leaving Franco to establish a dictatorship that continued to persecute former loyalists and ruthlessly commit countless atrocities. The Shadow of the Wind is divided into two stories, one of which takes place from the perspective of a young adolescent, the other experienced by a witness of past events. Raised by a widowed father, 10-year-old Daniel Sempier comes of age to select a book from the Cemetery of Forgotten Books, a huge library of forgotten titles. According to tradition, the first time someone visits this place, he must choose a book and adopt it, making sure it will never disappear, that it will always stay alive. Daniel chooses a book called The Shadow of the Wind by Julian Carax and is immediately absorbed into the incredible writing. Fascinated with Julian Carax, the author, Daniel searches for more of his works only to realize his copy of The Shadow of the Wind is one of the few remaining in existence. For decades, someone has been seeking as many of Julian Carax's books as possible to burn them all. Not exactly the most subtle kid. Daniel soon lets people know that The Shadow of the Wind is in his possession, many of whom are interested in purchasing the rare copy. One night, Daniel is approached by the person responsible for the systematic destruction of Carax's work, someone who calls himself Lying Cobert, a faceless man whose name is derived from the devilish character in Carax's The Shadow of the Wind. Cobert is described to have eyes like glass beads, a rasping wounded voice, no nose, lips, or eyelids, and a face that is nothing but a mask of black scarred skin, consumed by fire. Julian Carax himself described Colbert as the Prince of Darkness. Who is this man, and why is he so determined to eradicate Julian Carax from existence if he's using the name of Carax's character? Colbert offers to buy the book off of Daniel, but Daniel refuses and runs off, believing Julian Carax's memory must be preserved. Over the years, Daniel experiences many of the things that young adolescents come across in their teen years. He has a crush on a pretty girl, he makes friends with a boy called Tomas, and he starts to work alongside his father in the bookshop. All the while, Daniel searches for answers pertaining to Julian Carax's life, wanting to understand more about why such a great writer failed to sell little more than a few hundred copies of his books. So, Daniel has grown up. Along the way, he takes in a beggar named Fermin Romero de Torres, a former government intelligence agent with sleuth-like instincts who worked for the Republicans during the Civil War and was later imprisoned and tortured by the infamous inspector Francisco Javier Fumero. Fermin is a kind man, described to have a young swell and pencil mustache like that of a movie star. Readers consider him pretty hilarious, since he teaches Daniel about the birds and bees and how to seduce women. But Fermin is also a very damaged person, with deep marks that showed on his wrists and ankles, his trunk and back. At one point, he locks himself in his own room, swearing that he would slit his own throat. Fermin attempts to repay Daniel's kindness by working in the family bookshop and soon becomes Daniel's best friend and closest confidant, aiding him in his quest for Julian Carax. Through numerous visits to places where Julian had visited, Daniel comes across a photograph of Julian and a mystery woman named Penelope Aldaya, who promised him in a letter that she loved him from the very first day and that she still loves him. All the while, Daniel reunites with his friend Tomas's sister, Bia Aguilar, who he immediately falls for. Bia is betrothed to another, but seeing Daniel causes her to betray the wishes of her father, an affluent man who has built a new empire atop the ruins of the formerly wealthy Aldaias. Daniel loves Bia, each and every detail of her enticing and exquisitely clad anatomy. As they secretly meet, he goes home with a painful desire and an indescribable restlessness to see her again. Unfortunately, Don Aguilar and Tomas soon find out about Bia's relationship with an unnamed boy. And Tomas tells Daniel that Papa Aguilar has sworn he'll find out and he'll break his legs and his face as soon as he knows who it is. For me, just listen, struggling not to laugh, soaking in dr dramatic irony. Daniel confesses to Tomas, damaging their friendship as Tomas becomes coldly serious and distant, warning him, Don't hurt my sister. Romero, while appearing amiable at first, is an incredibly sketchy dude. He prowls about, generally putting the fear of God into everyone who he considers a threat to Franco's regime. One such example was when Fumero brutalizes one of Daniel's neighbors for being gay and parades him through the jail cells believing such faggotry requires a lesson. Fumero and Fermin cross paths multiple times, with Fermin often becoming the victim and Fumero the bully. 
It's interesting to see parallels in their two characters, both of them with similar appearances and backgrounds in service to their respective sides during the war. However, Fumero gives off a nasty vibe of faithlessness, the type of person who always plays on a winning team, giving up anything to be on top. Fermin is genuinely a loyal and nice guy, qualities that result in his becoming Fumero's punching bag. Every seeming truth that comes out of Fumero's mouth is ironically BS. Over several months, Daniel maintains his clandestine relationship with Bia while also meeting several of Julian's former acquaintances, including a woman named Maria Monfort, who initially lies about her knowledge of Julian's death. Maria appears mysterious and not exactly forthcoming, most likely due to a troubled past associated with Julian Carax, with Daniel imagining her sitting alone, her eyes poisoned with tears. Daniel feels pity for her and wants to believe what she's saying is the truth, but Fermin instead talks some sense into him, stating that Daniel's shown a nice pair of boobs and he thinks he's seen St. Teresa, telling him to just leave her to me. Good old Fermin believes that at my age, the flow of blood to the brain has precedence over that which flows to the loins. Inappropriate. Maybe. True. <laughs> yep. Upon a second confrontation with Nuria much later, Daniel asks Fermin to follow Nuria, and an ensuing struggle with the sudden appearance of Inspector Fumero leaves Nuria murdered and Fermin framed as her killer. Daniel and his father are placed under surveillance while Fumero viciously assails Daniel, asking information on Fermin's whereabouts and his search for Julian Carax. Maybe Fumero is lying covert? Meanwhile, Papa Aguilar has confined Bia in her room, forbidding her to leave the house, so Daniel is unable to communicate with her whatsoever. He grows increasingly apprehensive, but Tomas shuts him out. Daniel attends Nuria Monfort's funeral, which leads him to a manuscript she wrote titled Remembrance of the Lost, detailing the life of Julian Carax and her enduring love for him. As Daniel reads, the novel shifts to Nuria's perspective, unraveling the mystery of the past. Julian Carax was born to Anthony Fortuny and Sophie Carax. Anthony was known as the Hatter and was not a loving father, often abusing his wife, especially due to allegations that Julian was not his biological son, but the son of a man Sophie had an affair with. The Hatter treated Sophie as an unfaithful servant, leading to an estranged relationship of master and servant. He did not consider his son a true Fortuny due to his parentage and his bookishness, outwardly showing contempt for the boy. But despite this, at the bottom of his heart, Antony did love his wife and son. Antony intended for his son to grow up to inherit his business, but as fate would have it, the head of the wealthy and famed Aldaya household, Don Ricardo, came in one day to buy a hat. Julian impressed Don Ricardo with his wit and charisma, eventually interesting him enough to offer a scholarship to one of the finest schools in the country, San Gabriel's. When Julian left Antony, the hatter felt an empty sadness in seeing his son leave. Don Ricardo was very generous, treating Julian as a son he always wanted, and invited him to his house to meet his son, Jorge. There, Julian saw Penelope Aldaya for the first time, who would become the love of his life, aka the woman in the letter. Anyways, in school, Julian and Jorge formed a close-knit group of friends, which included three other people, Fernando Ramos, the cook's son, Mikel Moliner, the son of a wealthy arms manufacturer, and Francisco Javier Fumero. Fumero was always the outcast of the group, raised by a mother who prided herself in her son's association with powerful people such as the Aldayas. Her obsession with attaining celebrity status came to a melting point when she forced Fumero to attend a party wearing a cheesy sailor costume that caused him to become the laughingstock of the celebration. These events shaped Fumero as a man, and he eventually grew up to become erratic, violent, and driven by rage. As Julian grew up, he soon courted Penelope, Jorge's sister, in secret, and a romance blossomed between the two right under the nose of Don Ricardo. Does this sound like a character previously mentioned? Julian continued to do as much as possible to impress Don Ricardo to remain close to his daughter, stating he would pursue a career in banking. However, it turns out that at the party, which just happened to be the most humiliating moment of his life, Fumero saw Penelope and Julian together making out. Fumero loved Penelope from afar, which he claimed had been a pure love, a true love, like the one you saw in movies, while always hoping to form a relationship with her when the time came. What a tragedy. Fumero hated Julian, Don Ricardo's preferred son and always the favorite child, able to get people such as Mikel and Fernando to love and follow him. In the face of mockery after his incident at the party, he pulled out and aimed a rifle right at Julian, who barely managed to escape alive as Mikel tackled him, sending Fumero to prison. Very similar to Daniel's situation, Penelope and Julian came to adore each other, clandestine meetings taking place and eventually to a point where they promised to elope. 
After Julian planned with Mikkel to avoid the two to escape to Paris to start a new life, he made love with Penelope for the first time, where they rubbed body parts passionately. But as fate would have it, Don Ricardo caught the two in bed. Infuriated, Don Ricardo locked Penelope in her room and physically beat her while expelling Julian from San Gabriel's and causing him to be drafted into the military. Julian, with Mikkel's help, ran to Paris not knowing what had become of his paramour. It is revealed that the rumors of Julian's parentage were in fact true, that Sophie Carax had had an affair with Don Ricardo, and Don Ricardo was in fact Julian's biological father, making Julian and Penelope half-siblings. Eh, eh, which is some Game of Thrones Oedipus Rex level messed up. Don Ricardo's entire world went up in flames as he considered Julian as the heir to his legacy, for Jorge was weak, reserved, and lacking his father's steadfast spirit, while Julian had the soul of a poet. Ashamed of such a scandal as ignorance, as well as his misplaced faith and benevolence towards Julian, Don Ricardo became emotionally broken, and his empire fell as he, his businesses failed. Penelope was revealed to carry Julian's child, a child born of incest. Neither of them survived, for J Penelope gave birth to the child isolated behind the locked doors of her bedroom, screaming for her parents to show mercy. Disturbingly, Penelope was found dead in a bed of blood, her son is stillborn. Unbeknownst to Penelope's faith, Julian waited in Paris, setting up shop as an author inspired by many of his experiences as a child. Soon, however, he received the false letter from Jorge that Penelope had given up on him, which Penelope had attempted to clear up with the letter that Daniel had found. The Aldaias moved to Argentina, and Jorge became increasingly resentful towards Julian's starting as an author and his hand in the besmirching of his family name and sister. The Aldaya fortune was quickly dissipating with Don Ricardo's deteriorating health, and in his final moments he entreated Jorge, his last resort, to take revenge and kill the man responsible, his former friend. Jorge, in his rage to hurt Julian for taking his father away from him, had always wished to live up to his father's expectations, swearing to take the fight to Julian as he returns to Barcelona years later in a clear case of moral and physical ruin. Unexpectedly, upon his return to Spain, he encounters and allies with Fumero, who has risen in power through the military ranks. Fumero's reputation outlasted his rank. He was talked about a great deal by the people in fear of his terrorizing tactics, including throwing his own commanding officer off a building to seize power. After all these years, the only man who had managed to escape Fumero's wrath was Julian, and Fumero simply waited for his chess pieces to properly line for the right moment for revenge. Meanwhile, Nuria Monfort came into the picture, working as a secretary under one of Julian Carax's publishing firms. On one of her business trips to Paris to arrange a meeting with Julian, she instantly fell for his charm and talents, but he never reciprocated her feelings. Nuria loved Julian nonetheless, for those two weeks she spent with him were the only time in her life when she felt for once that she was herself. Which was a shame for Mikhail Moliner, who soon fell in love with Nuria. Mikhail aged considerably for the worst of the years, growing weak and frail, and he squandered his family inheritance in an attempt to escape his family legacy, attempting to use this money his family had made through war profiteering to support public buildings as well as Julian's work, remaining ever so loyal to his childhood friend to his last breath. Mikhail loved Nuria, who carried a weighing guilt over friendzoning him, knowing him more as her only friend than someone she could love. Nevertheless, she married him in the belief that it was them two versus the rest of the world. Eventually, with nothing to lose, Julian decided to marry his landlord, Irene Marceau, who believed in his writing, and meant to secure his future through an uncomfortable marriage with a woman 25 years older than him. Hey, the price of getting rich is indeed very high. Word travels fast. Jorge is enraged by Julian's ease to forget about his sister and attain a superfluous amount of wealth while his families have been taken, while Fumero delightfully feels the fire by twisting the facts that Julian was to marry a princess from a fairy tale. The stark contrast between reality and Fumero's spun story reveals the lack of any sense of morality he is willing to go to to cleanse his own past, even pitting his two best childhood friends against each other. Fumero gives Jorge a gun, advising him to challenge Julian to a duel by triggering him just enough with half the truth, that Penelope was still waiting for him, dying of loneliness. Little did Jorge know, Fumero rigged the gun to blow up in his hand just so that Julian would murder his former friend in cold blood. Julian is forced to flee from Paris as a wanted murderer, deciding to return to Barcelona, where Fumero was waiting for him. Julian returned to his father as a fugitive, who wept with regret and joy at reuniting with his son. 
Seeing Anthony as such a broken man is really heartbreaking because even though he was a cruel father and husband, he did love his family deep down. Now, in Act of Redemption, he's willing to risk his life to cover up for his son. Julian meets up with Mikkel, who tells him what's been going on in Barcelona since he was gone. Mikkel doesn't know what's happened to Penelope, though. As they're talking, Fumero's men barge in and attempt to arrest Julian, only for Mikkel to quickly grab Julian's identification papers and gun, telling Julian to run. Mikkel and armed police fired each other, resulting in Mikkel's death. Mikkel lived to protect his friend, and he did so until his last breath. Fumero comes in to verify Julian's body. Even though he knows it's Mikkel, Fumero gives the okay, saying that without a proper identity, Julian is now no one, someone who can be killed and forgotten. Julian and Nuria meet up and visit the old Audea mansion in search of Penelope, only to find her grave, alongside Julian's dead sons. Shocked, mournful, furious, and hollow. Julian realizes the blood on his hands. Mikkel, Penelope, Jorge. Julian was angry at the world, but most of all, he was angry at himself. He hated himself for his absence, for if he had stayed, he may have prevented the loss of his family. He hated himself for effectively killing his two childhood friends. He leaves the house a new man, Lion Colbert, the devilish character of his novel as he literally viewed himself as the harbinger of death. He sets out to burn all the copies of his books, going from city to city, tearing his legacy to the ground. During one of the burnings, the fire grows out of control, and Julian is left scarred as a grotesque shell of his former self, covered in burns and blood. Nuria chooses to stay by Julian's side. Years go by. At a new job, she comes across a boss who attempts to make inappropriate sexual advances towards her. When she rebuffs him, he reports her to a now older Fumero, who comes in to publicly shame her as a dyke, a lesbian, ostracizing her from society. Julian reacts by murdering Samarty. Even though Julian saw this as payback for Samarty's cruelty, Julian has now deteriorated to a point seemingly beyond redemption. He literally commits cold-blooded murder, as Don Ricardo had once saw in him the soul of a murderer. Julian goes into hiding, and Nuria occasionally visits him. Anthony asks about his son's whereabouts, but Julian never comes to visit him, ashamed. Anthony dies, not living to see the end of the war, longing to reunite with his family. Time passes, with most of Julian's books pretty much all burned, with the exception of one, which belongs to Daniel St. Pierre. Julian initially just wants the book, but with Daniel's rejection, he grows interested, seeing a part of his romanticism in his young boy. Julian watches over Daniel from the shadows, which may sound a bit creepy. Nuria instead, however, sees this as a start to Julian's path to redemption, for Daniel appears to have so many striking similarities with Julian when he was young. She grows aware that Fumero continues his reign of terror, knowing she is next on his hit list. Nuria reveals that she wrote this manuscript in the event of her death so that Daniel could know the truth and learn from Julian's mistakes. Nuria's manuscript comes to a close in present time. Inspired, Daniel returns to Tomas, demanding to see his sister, not wishing to abandon her in her time of need as Julian had with Penelope. Tomas beats the crap out of Daniel, telling her that he impregnated her and she escaped the house to look for him. Fermin briefly comes out of hiding to rescue him and cares for his injuries. Daniel leaves Fermin to find Bia in the old Aldaya mansion, their old meeting place where he knows he will also find Lain Colbert, or Julian. However, he inadvertently leads Fumero to the mansion as well, where Fumero is determined to kill Julian once and for all. Julian and Fumero clash, only for Daniel to jump in the way when Fumero holds unarmed Julian at gunpoint. Daniel is shot, and Fumero turns to shoot Bia. Julian reacts furiously, killing Fumero to protect Bia, at last putting an end to this tyrant. Julian decides to leave, to return to hiding in the shadows. Before doing so, he tells Daniel in the hospital to live for him, hoping he will not make the same mistakes he once had. Daniel and Bia are married, but Daniel never manages to reconcile with Tomas, his former friend. True to his word, Daniel often visits Nuria's grave to commemorate her love and loyalty. As years go by, Fumero is gradually forgotten, his plaque covered by a big soda machine. Fermin is acquitted of his charges. Barcelona is at peace, and Daniel eventually receives a package containing a book written in a pseudonym which he instantly recognizes as Julian Carax. 
In the opening pages, he finds a preface dedicated to him and his wife, to, for rescuing him from the monster that was lying in Cogart. Daniel and Bea have a son, whom they named Julian. Daniel takes 10-year-old Julian to the Cemetery of Forgotten Books when he comes of age, passing down his own legacy to the next generation. The novel closes as father and son walk into the quiet streets of Barcelona, their steps lost forever in the shadow of the wind. Thanks for watching. The Shadow of the Wind is really a fascinating tale of love, betrayal, mystery, revenge, and other elements related to the human psyche. It takes place in a time that is often forgotten, but Carlos Ruiz Afon ensures that the sacrifices made during that time period are revered to this day.